Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and try to get started. Again, this is Erica Brakefield. Um, the other instructors we have in the room today are Leanna Cavan, Jessica Davenport, Rebecca Colligan, Sarah Wilhoy, and we also have Amber Ballinger with us. So if you have any questions for any of us at any time, um, you will need to type them in and submit them through the, through the webinar app. And bear with us, please. We are using this for the first time, so we are trying to learn as we go. Okay. So, again, if you haven't registered via train, please go ahead and do so at this time, and we'll get you approved to get on the list. Um, after this class is over, it will be reposted on here. Um, through another course number, I believe. So it will be available to view if you have the health department staff that aren't able to watch this today, they can go back and watch it later for credit. We have submitted this for RS hour approval, so we will send the list in after the class has been approved. All right, if you have questions at any time as we're going along, go ahead and send those in to us so we can answer them as we go um, to make it a little bit easier. And um, with that, I think we're ready to get started. Okay. And pardon us, we're going to switch out speakers several times. So we may mute it a couple of times as we switch speakers. We only have one seat that we're working with here. All right, we're going to get started. <clears throat> so this is the update of the Kentucky Youth Camp Regulation 902 KAR 10040. So this regulation was required to be update, updated due to the passage of Senate Bill 236. Hang on, let me switch the slide here. How do I advance this? Okay, there we go. Okay, so due to the passage of Senate Bill 236 during regular session 2017, codified as KRS 194A 380-383, this uh, statutory change required background checks to be implemented for prospective employees, contractors, and volunteers at Kentucky Youth Camps. This also included other facilities beyond youth camps. Um, however, for the purposes of this, we're just doing the youth camps today. We were only required to change the youth camp regulation. Okay, the, the youth camp reg was open for amendments um, to add the uh, changes due to this statute. Further amendments were made during the public comment period, which went on during spring 2018. Um, we received comments from a number of health departments as well as um, affected youth camps within the state and made some changes. From that, a regulation hearing was, was uh, heard on August the 13th of this year. And that is the date at which the final regulation that we have sent you for today became effective. All right, we're going to switch out speakers now. So hang on just one minute. Hello all, it's Jessica Davenport here. Let's move on to the definitions and the changes in those definitions. Under section one, um, definition two for camp or youth camp, everything you see that is not underlined, that's what was in the original regulation, but what is underlined? Oh, this is in advance. Hold on just a second, it didn't advance. All right, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so everything you see here that is not underlined was originally in the regulation. So the portions that are underlined are what's new. So a camp or a youth camp is going to mean any area, parcel, or tract of land under the control of a person on which facilities are established, maintained, or operated for recreational, educational, or vacation purposes for five or more children to attend 
no longer than two weeks. So that's important, the two week mark, either free of charge or for payment of a fee. So basically this just clarifies the definition by specifying that child has to attend the youth camp no longer than two weeks. And Adam Massey, if you're listening, that should uh, clear up that question you had for me earlier this week. Okay. So a camp or youth camp is going to include a day camp, a primitive or outpost camp, or a residential camp. camp. This separates our definitions of what a day camp, primitive or outpost camp, and versus a residential camp. <clears throat> Okay, so this is very important, especially for those of you who have uh, secretaries that send out your invoices for permits. There are certain things that have been included under youth camps that are no longer going to be youth camps. So under camp or youth camp, what it does not include is any facility that's operated as an instructional studio or a center that provides lessons or other activities for school-aged children individually or collectively during parents' working hours before or after school or during school vacation periods. A vacation Bible school, Bible day school, or similar activity held in a church for school-aged children individually or collectively during parents' working hours before or after school or during school vacation periods, or a wilderness camp licensed as a private child caring facility pursuant to 922-KAR-1460. So this is what are not youth camps. And I know there's probably several of us out there that have some of these that fall under those guidelines uh, permitted as a youth camp. And I know that those um, uh, getting the permit renewal uh, notices out um, go out pretty soon. So you need to pay attention and actually look at your facilities now to see if it even qualifies as a youth camp. And especially those that have administrative assistance that do that for you, you need to make sure that those people don't erroneously send those um, permit renewals to those places. Okay. So for permit renewals, permit establishments that are affected by the clarification of the youth camp definition, section one, paragraph two of 902KR10040 are not eligible for permit renewals after December 31st, 2018. So make sure those don't get sent to those establishments. If they already have been, you may want to go ahead and contact those establishments and explain to them that they're no longer going to be falling under the youth camp regulation. All right, so <clears throat> definitions for a day camp. What a day camp is means a camp operated for all or part of the day, but what it does not include is obviously overnight lodging of campers and also does not include a camp operating at a facility under a different cabinet license or permit or that is already a already subject to routine sanitation and safety inspection by the cabinet. So these are those establishments that might have permits through Office of Inspector General. Say if they're um, like a, for instance, um, a private school that already has their uh, permit through the OIG, Office of Inspector General, to be a daycare. If they advertise something, say over spring, that they're going to have a camp, well, they already are inspected through OIG. So that's where that would still fall. So, okay. All right, so disqualifying offense. This is uh, pursuant to the KRS 194A. The 194A is what is requiring the background checks. So disqualifying from being cleared for background check is gonna be any conviction or a plea of guilty to a criminal offense against a minor a sex crime or a violent offense. And this is language directly from Senate Bill 236 as reasons why someone may not be employed by or volunteer at a youth camp. A permit to operate a youth camp issued pursuant to this administration regulation shall not exempt a 
child care facility or program from the licensure required by 922 KAR Chapter 2. And this is a clarification that a facility that has a youth camp permit is not exempt from having a child care facility licensure under 922 KAR Chapter 2. And please give us just a moment where we're going to go ahead and switch speakers. Good morning, everybody. This is Rebecca Call again. Glad to be with you all this morning. Um, we're going to continue on with regulation updates. And as Jessica said, um, as you'll notice on your PowerPoint slide, um, if it's got a line drawn through it, that's language that we have taken out. If it is underlined, that is new language that has been put in. Just wanted to reiterate that. Um, when you look on regulation update section five, which is camp facilities, this is talking about um, the structures for human occupancy. Um, there is currently no federal flammability standards for tents. Therefore, this requirement was removed from the regulation. So you'll see that the language that says, except for tents, which shall meet federal flammability standards was taken out on that slide. Continuing on under Section 5, Camp Facilities, um, added in was number five. All structures used as sleeping quarters shall have outer openings screened or protected to prevent the entry of insects and other vermin. Um, so just remember on this one, all facilities are required to have all outer openings screened in the sleeping quarters. Section seven deals with personal hygiene facilities. Um, as you will see under number four, um, we've added in the citation for the state plumbing code, which is 815 KAR chapter 20. Um, we also clarified a maximum water temperature reading of 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so you'll notice on the end of number four right there, um, shall be used to prevent delivery of water at a temperature above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So definitely mark it if it's above 120. Continuing on with Section 7, Personal Hygiene Facilities. Um, added in is the language, all windows used for room ventilation shall be screened and outer openings protected in the toilet and personal hygiene facilities. Um, so windows are required to be screened in um, the toilet room in the personal hygiene facilities. All right, moving on to section eight, sewage and wastewater disposal. Um, we've added in the regulation citations for the sewage and wastewater disposal, which you'll see um, under number two right there. We've added number two and added the word if. Um, also, under the requirements, you will see it's in 902 KAR 1085. Um, and of course, the language change of the Energy and Environment Cabinet in KAR Title 401. We've also broke it off into number three. You'll see number three underlined. If a public sewer system um, becomes available, connection shall be made to it, and the camp sewer system shall be discontinued upon failure of the private system. Um, the upon failure of the private system was added in. Um, and that's new. If they, if they do have a private system that is failing, the facility must connect to the sewer system um, if and when it becomes available. Uh, 
All right, moving on to section nine, which is the water supply system. Um, we cleaned up some wording on this one and added the citation of the current food code and the EEC's regulations on water quality. You will notice under number two, um, we've added the language energy and environment um, for the change of the wording. We've added a number three, which is what we just talked about a minute ago. If a public water supply of a municipality or water district subsequently becomes available, connection shall be made to it and the camp supply shall be discontinued. Under number four, you will notice again, we added in the KAR for the plumbing code, which is 815 KAR chapter 20. Um, and you also notice under number four, I'll just go ahead and read that one. Adequate drinking fountains um, that meet the state plumbing code or drinking water containers of an approved type shall be used within the camp. Common drinking cups, glasses, and vessels, and we added in shall be prohibited. Um, under number five, if portable drinking water containers are used, they shall be easily cleanable, kept securely closed, and designed so the water, and added in, is withdrawn from the container only by tap water or faucet and shall be maintained in a sanitary condition. Number six, um, all ice shall be from an approved source. The new language of water in accordance with Title 401 KAR and 902 KAR 45005. And also down at the bottom, um, when it's in reference to the approved construction, the new language is in accordance with 902 KAR 45. 005. So on that one, it was a lot of cleaning up of the language. All right. Section 10 deals with refuse handling. Um, added in is a number two. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong slide. Section 10, refuse handling. Um, on number one, we added in the language of avoid when we're talking about the storage, collection, and disposal of refuse shall be conducted to avoid a health hazard. Also under number one, we've added in the KAR um, Title 401. You will notice that there at the end. On number three, um, container storage and the added in language is that has been approved by the local health department shall be provided and shall be designed and maintained to new language, avoid a nuisance, which is what we're, which is the whole goal right there is to avoid a nuisance. Right. Moving on to section 11, which is the maintenance of animal facilities. Um, the number one, we're talking about barns, stables, corrals, and other structures where we house animals. Um, used to house animals shall be located at least 500 feet from any sleeping, eating, or food preparation area. Tie rails or hitching posts shall not be located within 200 feet of a dining hall that was added in. Kitchen or other place where food is prepared, cooked, or served. Um, number three, we added in um, an A language, and that's talking about the animal waste. The manure shall be re removed from the barn stalls and crowds as often as necessary to prevent attracting flies or becoming a breeding place for flies. So we want to focus in there on the addition of the language attracting flies. We also added in um, a section B, manure disposal shall be handled in a manner that does not create a nuisance or contaminate surface or groundwater. All right, moving on to section 12 of the regulation updates, swimming facilities and recreational water activities. Um, under number one, the language was added, a public swimming and bathing facility. 
shall comply with 902 KAR 10120. Um, you will also notice under number two, all small craft and boating activities shall be conducted in compliance with the new language's requirements of the Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet pursuant to 301 KAR Chapter 6. Um, new language under number three um, would be the lifeguard certification, and I'll go ahead and read it. All swimming and small craft and boating activities shall be under the supervised supervision of a person holding a current American Red Cross lifeguard certification or its equivalent at all times. So it can't just be anybody. It needs they need to have a lifeguard certification. All right, moving on to section 13, insect rodent and pest control. Um, under number one, we've added in um, there at the end, pursuant to KAR Title 3A2, just listing out the KAR where we're talking about um, the controlling insect and rodent, rodent harborage infestations. Um, under number two, camps shall be maintained free of accumulations of debris that can provide rodent harborage or be breeding places for other pests. And then under number three, storage areas, um, they just need to be maintained to prevent harborage. So no change on that one. All right, we are gonna have a speaker change right now. So we're gonna mute it here just for a second. Okay, this is Erica again. We received a question uh, from Justin Hancock. He asked, if not permitted by the local health department, do we, do we refer these facilities to OIG for inspection? Um, if, if it's something that you think falls within the daycare uh, regulation, yes. Um, at this time, if it's in one of the in-between categories, yeah, you can definitely go ahead and refer it to them but it may fall in the area that no one regulates at this time. Um, if that didn't answer the question, and I know it's kind of a, a confusing answer right now, but there are some facilities that are just going to fall between and not be permitted at all right now. Um, let me know if that didn't answer that. Hang on one second, everyone. We're trying to trying to work our question question and answer bar. Just a second. All right. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Jennifer Bardroff sent in another question. What kind of facilities fall under the they don't get inspected category? Um, right now, it, it would be the all day schools like the karate schools, gymnastics, all these type facilities that are offering what they call camps during the summer, but they keep the same kids all summer long. Those are going to fall in the middle category. OIG is currently writing a regulation that's going to address those because we agree they are more closely related to child care than they are to youth camps. And as they keep children all day long, their intent is to provide a daycare service. So um, those 
OIG really wanted to get a handle on because of the services they are offering so they can make sure they have appropriate ratios and things like that. That's the reasoning for it. But right now it's going to fall kind of in between. All right. All right. Hang on. We're going to switch speakers again. So just a second. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Leanna Kevin, and I'm going to continue um, with Section 14. Um, Section 14 covers camp director records and reports, medical supervision, and first aid. Um, this is the section where the um, requirements of KRS 194A.382 and 383 was actually put into the regulation um, that requires, again, the background checks. Um, the item 2A actually says that they can submit um, the DPP 156 form pursuant to 922 KAR 1470 section 3. Um, this form is actually available through the um, Department for Community Based Services. Um, so if you get questions about that form, um, that's where an applicant can find that form. Um, it is actually the regulation 922 KAR 1470 is actually the regulation for the central registry check um, that covers um, child abuse and neglect. So if there's any record of someone, an applicant um, in that registry, um, they would issue that in a letter to the applicant. So that is one way that they can fulfill the requirements of um, the background check, the KRS 192, or excuse me, 194. And I also want to add in there as well, um, if I can just go back here, maybe. About the DPP 156 form, um, this is actually probably one of the cheaper methods um, and ways that an applicant can actually get and meet that requirement of 194A. Um, it costs $10, I believe, is, is what they're telling us that it costs. They have updated their form um, back in January of 2018 to reflect the youth camp facilities. So there is a little check, check mark on there as well that the applicant checks um, when they do that that check for background checks. And Erica has something to add really quick. Um, since a lot of you have uh, Boy Scout camps in your area, um, I believe we spoke to a representative of the, the Boy Scouts a while back. They run their background checks all through a clearinghouse that's in Texas, I believe it was. I checked with our cabinet on the background checks and if those were acceptable. And what we determined is that as long as it is a check that is um, a national level, so they're checking all 50 states for you know, what they're looking for, um, that would be acceptable with us. I just wanted to throw that out there because I figured the question would come up. Okay, and just to continue on um, with the, the registry check with the DPP form that we just spoke about, um, they, the cabinet will then issue a letter to the applicant um, saying whether they pass that check or not. Um, and this is what this subsection 2B actually covers, um, that that letter will be issued to them and um, stating that the individual has no findings of substantiated child abuse or neglect found through that background check. Um, and this is also where um, Oh, excuse me. <laughs> that letter can then be submitted to the uh, youth camp director 
of course, this is not the youth camp director's responsibility to go out and um, submit for this background check. They're actually not even allowed to do that. It is the applicant's responsibility. So if you get questions um, from your youth camp facilities, make sure you let them know that it is the applicant, the employee, the contractor, the volunteer, it is their responsibility to submit for that check. And then therefore submit the letter, the findings to the actual camp operator. The camp operator is then required to um, keep a copy of that on record. And I believe it's it's in this next section that we're gonna talk about, um, but I did wanna go ahead and mention that. All right, so they can submit the DPP form and receive that central registry check through the cabinet, or this is also item or subsection three, actually covers some other ways that they can um, meet the background check and they can get a background check that's performed pursuant to 922-KAR-2280, finding no disqualifying offense, or they can um, get a state and national criminal background check, finding no disqualifying offense. And as Erica just mentioned, um, if they do a national criminal background check, that will cover everything as well. So that would suffice for the background check if it's a national check, okay? so. At the bottom of your screen on this slide, you can just see this is kind of a list of what an individual can do, what they must provide to the camp prior to being hired on or volunteering at the camp, prior to the individual's presence at the camp, essentially, um, is what the regulation says, um, that they have to provide that documentation to the camp. So one that could get a letter, and this is through filling out the DPP form, through the registry check, and getting that letter back, which is a $10 fee, um, they can do the background check um, like you would be in working in a daycare facility. Um, this covers the abuse neglect check, a national crime registry check, and a sex offender registry check. So they can submit that documentation or again the national and state uh, criminal background check can also be submitted. And again, the camp operator is responsible for keeping on file whichever documentation is received from the applicant. So for any any documentation that they receive to meet this requirement, they, they need to keep a record of that. And then when you're out on your inspections, you need to be checking for this um, to make sure that all of their volunteers, all their employees, all their um, contractors are receiving these checks and that they're keeping up with that documentation. Okay. Okay, sorry, I thought we had, might have had a question pop up. Um, just to continue on in section 14, um, it was added that adequate first aid supplies needs to be designated um, by the available or, or on-call physician as required in subsection nine of this section. And um, subsection nine just requires that they must have a nearby physician or an ER. So whatever first aid supplies, adequate first aid supplies that is designated for that, uh, from that physician um, needs to be located on the camp, the youth camp premise. Um, it was also added that an American Red Cross certificate is required by paragraph A or B of this subsection shall be kept on the camp premises and made available for examination upon request of the cabinet. So anytime you're out there on your inspections, um, this was added in just so that you guys have the authority to ask um, to see a copy of that certificate, um, who has the American Red Cross first aid and things like that. Okay, and also in section 14, subsection eight, um, it was this deals with your prescription drugs. Um, prior to the update of the regulation, it was required that all prescription drugs be kept in a locked cabinet or a container. Um, it was added in that the exception is medications for which a patient uh, must keep on them. So this, just to throw out some examples, would be like your, your EpiPens for those who have, a, you know, an allergy to a bee sting or children who suffer with asthma that have to keep their inhaler with them. As long as they have the documentation and it lists out um, three requirements of the documentation here, 
um, then they can keep that medication on them, on each camper can keep that medication with them. Um, so that documentation from the licensed healthcare provider must state that the purpose of the purpose of the medication, it must also state how the medication is to be administered, and it must also state that the medication may be retained by the patient for immediate use. So pretty much the physician designates that, that they need to be able to keep that um, medication on them. Okay, and just to continue on, um, subsection 10, um, give me just a moment, let me flip my page. Subsection 10 um, deals with any serious illness or accident that results in death or serious injury that happens on the campsite um, that it needs to be reported. Um, it's always been that it has to be reported by the end of the camping season by the camp operator. Um, so you guys probably sporadically got those forms in from your youth camp facilities. It is now required that any serious illness or accident must be reported by the next business day. Okay, so that, that's a big change. So you guys throughout the camping season may be receiving those forms. Um, if we receive them in environmental management up here in Frankfurt, we will forward those on to you guys. That way you are able to follow up if it's something, if it's a violation that maybe caused the accident or illness that resulted in the serious death or injury. It might be something that you all will follow up on. Um, so again, that is by the next business day. And we will talk a little bit more about the DFS um, 309 form and some changes that was made did as well at the end of the, the presentation, we have a form section. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But again, just to highlight, it was added in that this is a requirement by the next business day that they should be notifying you of, of those events. Okay, and we're going to do a quick change of speakers here, so give us just a moment. All right, everybody, it's Jessica again. Um, continuing on to section 15, this is the safety and accident prevention. All the camps shall comply with KRS 227.200 to 227.400. Basically, we added in the actual KRSs and the actual regulations that these things should be uh, abiding by um, to kind of uh, clear up any kind of ambiguous language. So like, as opposed, or for example, in paragraph two with the electrical system, we want to make sure that that's uh, pursuant to local local codes and 815KR7120. Um, the paragraph three, protection from natural hazards. Of course, you know, we want to make sure those campers are protected. So we added in potential hazards occurring naturally in the environment um, have to be plainly marked and any measures taken um, and procedures shall be followed to ensure the safety of the campers. Um, obviously, you know, with some of these youth camps, we can get some dangerous situations, um, you know, cliffs, sinkholes, things of that nature definitely need to be clearly marked if possible and um, protecting the campers in any way possible to keep them from getting hurt and hopefully uh, not having to submit those forms Leanna was talking about. And we also need to get rid of elimination of artificial hazards. Any, all insecticides, pesticides, and chemical poisons shall be plainly labeled and stored in a locked and secured place. So now we are requiring the lock, locking of um, insecticides, pesticides, chemical poisons, um, cleaners, all those things. Um, to make sure that kids don't get hurt. All right, so section 16, plan review for future construction. Basically, we just added up the fluff language in paragraph two, the plans, 
shall show instead of just saying shall show and added the word the. Uh, we also under um, section D of that paragraph to the separate floor plan of all buildings and other improvements constructed or to be constructed. We want to now start including those location and number of the personal hygiene facilities mm -hmm. and a plumber riser diagram for those facilities, just like we do with all the rest of our programs. Um, and this will assist you in being able to see if a camp does have enough restrooms, enough lavatories um, before physically going to the camp. So that way, hopefully you won't uh, run into anything that uh, you weren't expecting. And we're also requiring detailed drawings of any of that sewage disposal facilities, including those specifications. Obviously, if you are the inspector that put in the private system, you should have those already, but definitely if they're going to be hooking up to sewer, they're going to want to show that on their plans. And we also want detailed drawings of the water supply if the source is not public. So if the source is not public, uh, the location and the size of the water and sewer lines within the camp. All right, continuing on, um, basically talking about if artificially constructed swimming pools or beaches are planned, those plans and specifications shall be submitted to the cabinet for review and approval prior to construction pursuant to 902 KAR 10120. So if they're planning on putting on in any kind of swimming pool or beaches, they have to submit those plans and make sure they're approved um, with the cabinet and get that all cleared up to you before allowing campers into that. Okay, moving on to section 18, the suspension of the permit. Um, now with this permit suspension, this is um, a, works just a little bit differently than some of our other programs. Under paragraph one, if the cabinet has any reason to believe that an imminent public health hazard exists or if that permit holder has interfered with any of the authorized agents of the cabinet in their performance of their duties, that permit shall be suspended immediately. That shall be suspended, not an intention to suspend. They shall be suspended. Uh, upon notice to the permit holder prior uh, holding a hearing, prior to holding a hearing on form DFS 212, request for hearing. So basically guys, we're going to suspend the permit, then you're also going to have to turn around and give them a request for conference form because they can request that hearing and that will be granted as soon as practical. All right, we added in paragraph two. So failure to comply with the criminal background check and employment requirements established in that KRS 194A shall result in penalties pursuant to KRS 194A. So basically, if they have anybody there that is working at that camp or um, any volunteers that are working on the camp that have not completed their background checks, according to 194A, that's an immediate closure um, violation. So keep that in mind. So we will have to be checking through these background checks and making sure that everybody's keeping um, a good record of who has gotten it and making sure that those people who haven't completing it, haven't completed it yet, are not present at the camp. Okay, so paragraph A, or 3A, my apologies, in all other instances, the violation of the provision of this administrative regulation, the cabinet shall serve upon the holder of the permit, a written notice specifying the violation in question and afford the holder a reasonable opportunity to correct it under B. Uh, we are also, uh, this is where it works a little bit different from some of our other programs. If that permit holder or operator fails to comply with a written notice issued under the provisions of this administrative regulation, the permit holder or operator shall be notified in writing that the permit shall be suspended at the end of five business days. Most of our programs say 10, but this one says five, so keep that in mind. It's a little different. And following the service of the notice, unless a written request for a conference is submitted to the cabinet by the permit holder within that five business day period. So unlike our other programs where they're allowed to give us back that request for conference within 10 business days, this is five, so half the time. And all administrative conferences shall be conducted in accordance with 902 KAR 1400, which is exactly the way our other programs fall. 
All right, so section 19, reinstatement of suspended permits. So a person whose permit has been suspended may reapply uh, for reinspection on that DFS form and um, application for reinstatement suspended permits. And that's within the five business days following that receipt of the written request. Um, if they submit that form to you, the reinspection form, then you as inspectors have five business days in order to go out and reinspect, in order for reinstatement. Okay. Um, if the applicant is found to be in compliance with the requirements of the reg, then the permit shall be reinstated. If not, then they're suspended. So hopefully that's clear as mud. Okay, and section 20, oh, hold on just a second. We are going to switch speakers. This is Erica again. Um, oh, we have a, I'm sorry, we have several questions, I think, that didn't pop up very well. Um, so I'm going to answer a couple of them. Uh, one question we received was, are, who is responsible for letting the health departments know about this? You all will need to send an updated copy of the regulation to your existing um, youth camps. Um, also, because I know this question will probably come up and they will ask you all, about the forms. You're not responsible for providing them with the forms for the background checks. That, that has nothing to do with us whatsoever. Um, just give them a copy of the regulation and you can refer them on to the other agencies that provide some of those. Uh -huh. Commun uh, Department of Community-Based Community Services or whatnot. Uh, but you don't need to provide those forms. Uh, you, your only responsibility with the background checks will be to verify that they have done them when you're there. So they don't need to send these to you all after they have them done, but when you're going out and doing your inspections, just verify that they have the paperwork. Okay. Um, okay, we have another question that is uh, schools that provide summer camp for, for students would need to be sent to OIG. No, if this is a, some kind of a camp that's for students at a, at a regular school, we wouldn't look at that at all. That's just another school operation and we already inspect the schools on a regular basis. So that, that would be no. We wouldn't permit them. We wouldn't in addition, we wouldn't permit them in addition to being permitted as a school, nor would we send them on to OIG. Uh, we received another question from Sam Price, and I have a follow-up question for you, so I'm going to go ahead and read it out loud. Uh, we have a permitted youth camp for troubled boys. Oh, hang on, my screen moved. We have a permitted youth camp for troubled boys with a food service. They have school and stay longer than two weeks. Will we still permit this? Is this a camp? Is it residential? Is it more like a boarding home? Uh, I may need to talk to you about, offline about it. Uh, if you can give me a little bit more information, we'll try to answer it. Um, I'm going to switch now and let Leanna finish up and then we'll get back to the questions because there's more. Hang on one second.
Hi everyone, this is Leanna again, and we're going to continue um, in section 21. It has been added, um, the incorporation by reference, and this is where we've added um, citations for the forms that um, go along with the facility that's being regulated. So this is just a list, um, DFS 200, DFS 308, DFS 309, and DFS 340. And this is a requirement that they are telling us to put in now. Um, so anytime you see an updated regulation, you're going to see the incorporation of the forms by reference at the end. Um, and we're going to go through each of these forms in just a moment. But first, um, I wanted to make note that, as you can see at the bottom, um, it was taken out existing facilities and equipment. Um, and this is usually what people refer to as the grandfather clause, where they can continue to operate if they've been permitted under an old um, regulation that they can continue to operate as is. Um, the secretary's office has told us to take that out. So this was taken out of the youth camp regulation. Um, so you will want to make note of that. So, you know, even though they were per permitted years ago, they should be offering hot water at their lavatory or tempered water, I should say, at their lavatories, their windows need to be screened, things like that that have been added. Um, they, they have to meet that requirement as well because that was taken out. So be sure to take note of that and let them know about that. Okay, and we're just gonna go on. Um, we did send out an email and if you didn't get it, I apologize. We tried to hit everybody that registered, but we sent out an email that included um, all the DFS forms that were updated copies of those. We included um, the amended regulation so you can see all the strikeouts and the additions into the regulation. We sent um, the regulation that came directly off the LRC's website and we also sent you a copy of this PowerPoint presentation for you as well. Um, so we did send you all that information. If you did not receive that, um, please let me know, leanna.cavin at ky.gov and I will resend that out to you. Um, but we're just going to go through some of these forms. I'm just going to highlight some of the changes that were made to them. Um, the first one is DFS 200, the application for permit. And I know you guys use this form um, for a lot of your different facilities. Um, this form was actually just updated um, to add some additional fields to cover other program areas. And um, the most up-to-date version is um, 06 of 2018. Um, so anytime you use that form, um, you will want to use the newer version of that form. It's a two-page form, um, so just take note of that, that that form was updated. Um, when that form was updated, input was received from um, the food safety branch as well as various he local health departments across the state um, for revisions to this form. Okay, and the next form is your DFS 340, and this is your application and permit to operate a day camp facilities. Um, so this is only your youth camp facilities that fall under the day camp um, would submit their application on this form. Um, with this form, it was added just some general camp information is what's covered. Um, there is a section that deals with are you KRS 194A.382 compliant. And this is, again, the background checks that applicants must meet, just so that they're aware of that, that they still do have to meet that requirement. Um, and then um, there's also a section that was added in there about the camp being registered with the Kentucky Secretary of State's office. Um, so just take note of that, that that form was changed as well. Um, and the revision date was March of 2018. Okay, we'll just continue on. Um, the DFS 308 form is your youth camp inspection report form. Um, the revision date was 6 of 2018. Um, this form has changed rather significantly. Um, most of you guys who have been doing youth camp inspections know that um, the old youth camp form 308, it didn't have any critical asterisk violations like all of our programs do this this one was a little bit different in that it didn't have um, those denoted um, asterisk violations so we made that change um, so that you know critical violations are obvious they are you know asterisk and denoted they're the po four point violations um, 
also on this form, it was added what type of camp um, is this? Is this a residential camp or is this a day camp? It was also added um, a KRS 194A.382 compliant checkbox. And you can see that that's kind of in the top there under sewage disposal system. Um, so when you're out there on your inspections and you check their files, when they're compliant, just do a check checkbox there, um, check mark there um, that they are compliant. If they're not compliant um, for KRS 194A382, um, you would want to mark um, there. We've added just kind of like your your pool inspection report forms are. We've added a section under item 42, um, a notice of immediate suspension pursuant to 194A.383. Um, so if you go into a facility, you find out that they're not requiring the background check documentation from their, their applicant or their employees, volunteers, contractors, things like that. Um, go ahead and write no under the top and then also mark that box. Of course, Jessica just went over, um, this would be an immediate suspension, not of an intent to suspend an immediate suspension. And that's pursuant to KRS 194A.383. Um, and I just want to note, I don't know if we mentioned this or not, if you read KRS 194A.382 and 383, um, it does specifically say public funding, but um, the guidance that we have been given is we can't determine which youth camp facilities receive public funding. So we just across the board say, you know, um, that they have to meet the requirements for background checks. All of them do. All of your youth camp facilities have to meet that requirement. Okay. So if you get questions about that, um, you get facilities that may say, hey, I don't receive public funding. Um, the guidance that we have received is that they still have to meet that background check requirement. Okay. Um, also, a few of the violation item numbers have changed. Um, we've, you know, combined some of the, the violation items together. Um, some of them we kind of split out. So be sure when you're on your inspections um, just to take a good look because um, things have changed. Actually, I think the old form had 49 violations. So we've decreased a little. I think there's there's 42 now. So just take note of that. So things such as your windows being screened is now a violation um, and those requirements we have added in there. Okay. And the next form is your DFS 309 form. Um, this is the Kentucky Youth Camp Accident and Illness Report. Um, the revision date is 03 of 2018. Of course, this is your form that um, youth camps need copies of that, so that, you know, if there's an accident where a child is seriously injured or death occurs, they can submit that to you. Of course, like, like I mentioned earlier, this was a requirement that they submit this at the end of the camping season, but now it is that they submit that immediately or by the next business day. And that is actually noted on the bottom of the form. We, we did put that in the bottom of the form so that they are aware that this form has to be submitted by the next business days. Um, I believe all the information has pretty much stayed the same. It's just kind of in a different format. Um, so, if you have any questions about that, let us know. This form it was sometimes referenced as um, CHPS-43, and so we've just changed that. It is now DFS-309, okay? All right, so it sounds like we're going to go. We've got a few more questions to answer. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in, and we'll, we'll go through them. So give us just a moment. Okay, this is Erica again, back to questions. 
Um, Sam sent me the follow up. They live in cabins or court ordered to be there. Uh, we do the food service. I've always looked at the cabins as a youth camp. Sam, that actually sounds like a confinement facility to me. Um, we'll we'll give you a holler later on and see if we can work through it. Um, it it may need to be com it may need to be permitted as a as a boys uh, confinement camp. Um, there are quite a few of them across the state. They're permitted as confinement facilities, but we'll talk to you and get that straightened out. Um, Let's see, Justin Hancock, back to schools. What if a youth camp is ran, oh, what if a youth camp is ran by an outside agency but held within a school? Um, Laura actually asked me this yesterday afternoon. I'm gonna check and get some guidance on that. Typically we say the camp is tied to the, the youth camp permit is more tied to the facility than the you know, people that run it. We're looking at the facility and what is there. Um, so I wanted to check and be sure if that needed to be permitted or not, if it's ran by an outside agency that is not the school. So I will get back with you all when I find out that answer. Uh, Matthew, I, James, what if it is a university, not a grade school? Um, that is not going to be a youth camp, I don't believe. We, what if it's run by a university, not a school? Because we don't, we don't permit universities. Hang on one second. I got to pull up my own definition. What? Did I get a follow-up question? Hang on one second, guys. All right, Matthew, we had a quick consult. We all agree the university would not be permitted as a youth camp. All right. More questions, hang on. Um, Justin, again, is the youth camp inspection report being updated on mobile environmental inspection? Sorry, I forgot. To program through CDP, that's okay. Um, it's not accurate right now. It's still the old form. We were dealing with this all day yesterday, trying to get it corrected, and we're still working on it. So no, it is not correct now. The correct forms are only on the website at this time. We, we've got to get them um, printed, and we need to get them updated on CDP. Okay. Are there any other questions? Because I've reached the end of my question queue. And Sam, we will get back with you too. I'm gonna hang on a minute. I'm gonna put y'all on mute. Let us know pretty quick if you have any more questions.
Okay, we're still hanging on to see if we get any more questions. I wanted to let you all know, um, after you finish this, you will need to go back and train and do uh, an assessment. There's a generic assessment to just finish the course, and then we'll get that roster, and after we get RS hours approved, we'll submit the, the names for approval. Um, anything else? We'll find out on the forms as well. When those forms are updated, we will send out an email and let y'all know. Any more questions? We'll hang on for a few more minutes, but that is the end unless you have questions. So thanks for tuning in. We'll give you five more minutes to submit questions. Hey, I received a question from Kathy Akins. I just wanted to verify she has a camp. New kids each week offers horseback riding lessons. She will not be a camp now, correct? I think Leanna said she talked to you about this when it does sound like it is a camp. It has barns, rustic environment, that type thing. Uh, from what she said you've talked to her about, it would be a camp. Let us know if you have more questions on that. Okay.
Hang on. Guys, I think um, along with that, some of the question is these, the things that are outside the realm of what we're really looking for with the overall intent of the youth camp regulation are these things that are in like a strip mall, like, you know, a, a self-standing building somewhere, like a karate studio or a gymnastics studio or an art studio, things of that nature. Um, that's not really what the youth camp regulation is geared toward. We're looking at the sewage and the water and the, you know, barn facilities, hitching posts, um, things like that. So if it's, you know, in a standalone building or in a mall or something like that, and they're offering lessons to the same groups of kids all summer long, that is outside of the realm of what we're looking at. But if it's, you know, a day long thing that's run for one week at a time and they're offering horseback riding lessons or something to that effect. That is more of what we're looking for. I hope that answers answers some of the question. All right, everybody. Again, thanks for listening. We haven't gotten any more questions, so we are going to, to end the webinar. If you think of anything later, you look over all this material and you have questions, by all means, feel free to contact any of us, okay? Um, did, did you send out our contact information? Most of you have our contact information. Just, just call one of us. Uh, myself, Leanna Cavan, Jessica Davenport, Rebecca Colligan or Sarah Wilhoyt. Thank you all very much.